Welcome to the Shivan Library. The fifth North Star Cup tournament of 2023 is upon us, and this time we are doing something different. We have taken a chapter from Timmy the Sorcerer's Spellbook and are playing Color Clash. If you are not familiar with Timmy's channel, for some odd reason, there is a link down in the description, and I highly recommend you give his videos a watch. Now, this format emerged from Timmy's crew, and unfortunately our local players missed it. So, instead of waiting for the next one, we decided we wanted to try it out for ourselves, to see what the fuss is all about, and the idea seemed really interesting to us. So, first things first, what is Color Clash and what are the rules? At base level, Color Clash is a Swedish old school variant, so we follow that banned and restricted list to the extent that it matters. Big thing is that we won't be seeing any fallen empires at all, but unlike normal Swedish, mana burn is in effect. The big rule, and kind of the whole point of it, is that decks must be monocolored. No splashing anything, but as this is not commander. Color identity is not a thing. So ground, that's okay in blue, and Wormwood Three Folk is just fine in green. To prevent all players from playing just robots with a little splash, a deck can only have eight artifacts, and off-color Moxen are banned. To make sure that we truly explore the color space given, all artifacts and non-basic lands are also restricted. This has some significance to the card choices in your deck, especially when you think about cards like Mishra's Factory and Maze of Ith not being around in large quantities. There are also no sideboards, just minimum of 60 cards in your main deck and that's it. Color hosers are extremely powerful when all players are using just one color in their deck, so no sideboarding just leads to better games. You are allowed to use those hosers in your main deck, but most of the time they just might not do anything, so it's not really a risk worth taking. That being said, Slate of Mind and Magical Hack could be a fun one to build around, but unfortunately Blue has pretty much the worst color hosers in old school, so that's about that. And those are the rules. In the end, it's just monocolored old school. And I, for one, am really looking forward to seeing what people came up with. Now that we've gotten the rules out of the way, let's take a look at what kind of a spellbook I pulled from the shelves to bring into this tournament. I'm going in this time with a blue deck that plans to just fly over my opponents. No control, no slowing down, just curve out flyers, buffs, and tempo out the opponent. There is not a single counterspell of any kind in this deck. That is not what I wanted to do this time, even though I am on blue. Basically, I just opened up the list of all flying blue creatures and chose the ones that hit the curve nicely. I was really hoping I could have made this a 2020 deck, but unfortunately upkeep costs required me to add two more lands. 20 lands, 20 creatures, and 20 spells is how we used to build decks back in the day, and it still can work in some rare occasions, but not quite here. The creature package starts with Flying Men and Zephyr Falcons as a blow-end creatures. Weak, but with a little buffing they can do some damage. The next section, they're the fun ones. Phantasmal Forces and Ghost Ships. Phantasmal Forces is the big deal here. Flying 4-powered creature with only 4 mana and an upkeep cost is still pretty nice for old school. Ghost Ship is mainly to be a bolt-proof creature that can be annoying in the late game with that regeneration. The last batch is the big hitters, Serenity Befreeds and Air Elementals. These are your standard strong blue creatures and we've all seen how good they can be. Though in Color Clash, Serendips become an even better option, because City in a Bottle, Maze of Ith, they're now restricted. And for my list, there is no Mahamodis here, so those are just too expensive to cast and don't really hit the curve right. Then, next one, we're gonna move to the buffs and extra creatures. Sunken Cities and Unstable Mutations can speed up those little flyers, and Dance of Many is a multi-tool. It is always the best thing on the board, and I do have some among the good creatures, so it's rare to not have anything to copy on the board. For removal, I went with Bounce Effects, Psionic Blasts, and a single control magic. The idea was to tempo out the opponent rather than start really removing their cards. Making them guess the same card over and over again should buy me enough time for my creatures to get the job done. Psionic Blasts can also be used for that final few points of damage to close the game. Finally, the Singletons. 
Ancestral Recall, Time Walk, obvious choices, I am in blue, and the Fast Mana and Chaos Orb were also easy to slot in. As for the lands, 18 Basics, 1 Factory, 1 Strip Mine, Easy Tolaria, and the Maze of Ith. In a deck like this, that is often used more offensively. Making sure my blocked creatures aren't going to die, that is more important than making sure that I don't die to damage from their creatures. And there we have it. With no sideboard, that is the deck. Now, let's see how it works when we start the first round of our Color Clash tournament. But before we go, hit that like button and subscribe so you won't miss the thrilling old school games to come. Alright, heading down to game number one. I'm on the play and unfortunately had to mulligan down to five. So, two cards going down and in the deck like this that is kinda difficult. Hope I get to keep the speed up and get some pressure in early on. And this starting hand is, is pretty decent. It's a good way to start the game like Island Mox, that's always a fun start, and the Zephyr Falcon that's going to be start taking in some damage. Yeah, that's a 20 turn clock, not much at this point, but if I get any kind of buffs, that's going to do something great. Now, opponent had a little light issues right there. The glare is quite massive on that plane. Fortunately, he got it fixed and we can continue in a way that everyone can actually see the game. The Sapphire Falcon picks in, starts hitting for one, and we're getting some early damage in. And a Serendip Efri, that's an amazing turn to play. And he's hoping my opponent can't do anything, but unfortunately, there's the swords. The Serendip is dead. That kind of took away a lot of speed from my hand. I was really counting counting on that Serendip to actually do the damage, because um, the Sapphire Falcon alone isn't going to be much, but combined with the Serum Dip, that's four points a turn, that's quite a lot of damage. But let's see, opponent's going in with a white knight, so most likely this is gonna be a white weenie of sorts. And that might be a little issue for me, because especially that 2-2 um, first strike is is something it's pretty hard for blue creatures to deal with, especially these low curb ones. The Serendip, that could have been a good blocker here, but don't. <laughs> Sophia Falcon, yeah, the uh, Vigilance isn't going to be doing much when the opponent has first strike creatures. But right now, is we're still looking at two damage each, so things are looking up. That a Crusade is something you do not want to see in a match like this. If the opponent's getting a lot more creatures in, that little buff is going to rack up quickly. So, dropping down to 20 back from the 3 gain from the Serendip, and there is the little bugger himself. The banding is not going to be doing much. I highly doubt there's going to be a lot of blocking here, but who knows? Maybe, maybe my opponent's going to be swinging at some point with some funny little bands, but... For now, I think the safest way is to just go as wide as possible. Thinking about the Banalish hero, and yeah, just no need to band. Their creatures are bigger than mine, and the odds of me having any kind of instant speed buffs is pretty minimal. And a second white knight, this, this is looking kind of dire at this point. Especially for the fact that my hand is pretty much full of mana. I got an extra island right there and that's that's not gonna do much right now. And this is kind of what I'm fearing, especially playing against white decks, because they can go wide pretty quickly and the Crusade is so efficient card when dealing with things like this. Because, okay, if I had the Sunken City right about now, that would be perfectly fine. I have so much mana, it doesn't matter, but allowing them to just pump out more creatures, one after the other, yes, there's an alliance, and, and the keep of the fate, yeah, this is pretty much it, their board is going super wide, I'm down to seven life, my odds are pretty low at this point. Maybe control magic would be good, 
grabbing that uh, Keeper of Fate would be a great blocker at this point, but unfortunately, my hand does not look good. And doing a quick, quick math on this one, I think my game is over no matter what I'm capable of doing at this point. My creatures are going to be jumping, there's, there's nothing, there's a Black Lotus and game one goes to White Weenie. And let's hope the next one is better. And especially this start is going to be good. I get to keep all my seven cards and I start with the Flying Men. Now my starting hand is pretty decent. I got a uh, Sunken City in there. There's a Serenity Bafrit. Got a few lands in as well. So this hand could pan out quite well. Most likely I get a chance of dealing some good damage. Uh, seven Alliance. Yeah, that's a decent attacker. And I, I could easily go and trade the uh, flying men with the the lion, but that's not gonna be what I'm doing because I have <laughs> another one. That's gonna be easy champs for me if my opponent decides to attack. At this point, I'm kind of thinking like I do have to kind of control their tempo as well as trying to build up that pressure because the seven alliance is. Is a good one and if i could block it at this point before the crusades come in i'm gonna be a happy camper and my opponent is thinking about that exact same thing is the savannah lion worth the trade my flying man is going to be dealing only one damage but i might have some buffs they did kind of assume things from game one and there's the funny little plateau for my opponent. The fun story behind this is that my opponent actually did not have enough planes in their collection right now. So they had to splash in that one plateau, which is, uh, it is a restricted land, but you can still play the one copy of it. But in this deck, it's not going to be do anything else than just be a planes. In Color Clash, that does not matter at all because no one's going to be playing Blood Moon or anything like that. And my opponent decided not to attack, which is a good decision. The Savannah Lion is worth much more than my Flying Man, especially with the Benalish Hero. Now they could band up and attack, making sure that the Benalish Hero is the one that takes the damage and not the Lion. But my Flying Men are going to be swinging because I got the Serendip Afrit and three mana available. But my opponent is loaded up again. Swords again to the Serendip and my speed just got dropped down. But that's not an issue yet because I know I have the Sunken City in my hand. That's going to be dealing a lot of damage with these little creatures. The upkeep cost, that's going to be an issue, but not a big one. My opponent is punching in, dropping me down back to 20. And Tundra Wolves and Mesa Pegasus. And the Pegasus, that's that's something that's going to be a little problem. Because that will trade with my Flying Man. My opponent is probably going to be doing that. So Sunken City at this point, that's going to be the obvious choice. I got to get some damage in. This is going to be a tight race. My opponent currently has five damage on the board plus that factory. So I am looking at three turn clock at the moment. So I need to do something, something good here and hope I do not die before that. Opponent is swinging in and not using the factory but yeah that's a good reason to do it war elephant yeah that's a creature you don't see every day four mana two two trample and banding so yeah my opponent really went out with that banding banding in this one and i always love to see it banding is such an underrated ability and can do a ton of damage especially if used again used with the cards like maze of ith to really get the most out of it but this, this is a problematic point. I have a boomerang in hand, which I'm going to be using soon. And my opponent just played the wrong card from hand. He said he's playing Crusade and dropped in a Mesa Pegasus. Yeah, there's the correct card. And he's swinging out with everything. 
So yeah, easily, easily gonna be bouncing the crusade. I was really hoping to bounce the war elephant because that's something they couldn't play as quickly that would have taken out the activation cost of the Mishra's factory. But yeah, the crusade is feeling five points alone. So that's, that's an obvious pick. I am dropping down to six and now the big question. Can I afford to pay the cost of the sunken city? Because I'm looking at my hand. I have Phantasmal Forces in there. And that is the card I'm thinking about now. Because if I just pay it, I'm not going to be able to cast the creature. I'm going to be jumping with the Flying Men. And knowing that Crusade is coming down next turn, those Flying Men aren't going to be really worth much. Now, as of now, it would be that they would block the Lion and maybe the Mesa Pegasus, and there's going to be a lot of damage coming in through. So, no, I cannot I cannot pay it. I need the mana to do something better. But the hand isn't really helping me a lot. There is an Unsummon Phantasmal Forces and Air Elemental in my hand right now. I can't play the elemental, that's too expensive, but which is going to be better, the Phantasmal Forces or the Unsummon? And Unsummon, would, that would deal with the elephant. 3-3 uh, three, three elephant after the crusade comes, the trample is going to be an issue, but I don't think either of those alone is going to be good enough. But let's just drop in the fly, uh, Phantasmal Forces and see how bad this is gonna be. Of course, if my opponent has swords of, or any kind of like spell to affect my board, yeah, that's gonna be immediately game over. But right now we're looking at the fairly big board and my hand did not pan out the way I wanted. And yep, there's the crusade that we saw. And of course it's gonna be played this turn, no questions. It's the board is so wide that crusade is just going to be extremely useful. That's five points of damage added to, it. and one of those is going to be first strike damage. One is going to be trampling damage and the flying damage as well. And now opponents thinking, in talking we're talking about the uh, whether there's going to be any use of banding at this point or is it going to be just go as wide as possible. Because there, it would be fun, fun the band with some of those creatures, but that's not really going to be useful at this point. Yeah, everything is just coming in as wide as possible. Uh, right now, I'm doing the math that am I going to just die at this point? I'm at six life. That's that's really low and looks looks a bit bad. But let's just. Let's try this out. Let's see how how this works. So, Phantasmal Forces, that's going to be blocking... Yeah, that's going to be blocking the factory. It's, it's almost quite irrelevant who's going to be blocking who. Just don't pick the Trample creature and you're good. That's for the Lions, that's for the... Um, I think the Pegasus or Wolves... Yeah, I don't think it really matters who this is going to be. Yeah. There's still enough damage to drew me in. That game goes to white we need two and zero. <laughs> I got nothing at this point. And there we have it. First game done and that was a bit down. White Weenie is a strong deck in any old school format, so I guess it's not a big surprise that it's strong in color clash as well. The game one had a rough start with having the mulligan down to five, also getting a little flooded and losing the surrender straight away took away my chances to tempo out my opponent. And the draws my opponent got, I had no way of getting out of that one. The second game showed a bit more promise. I was able to do some damage, but the onslaught of little creatures followed by the crusade was just too much to handle. Having only temporary ways to dealing with opponent's card also showed its weakness. Boomeranging the crusade was good, but having it come back next turn and getting over on then is kind of difficult. But that is what you get when you pick blue. You can answer everything, but only temporarily. Looking at the deck after the first game, I kind of wish I put in a Timmy or two. <laughs> those would have been really good with dealing with those little creatures, but unfortunately Timmy doesn't have wings, so it doesn't fit the theme of the deck. 
It's interesting to see how many new ideas we come up with as the tournament continues. This is a completely new design space for me in terms of deck building, so fine tuning is something we will absolutely gonna see going forward. I'd love to hear about your ideas how to adjust the deck. Sure, we can't change the list in the middle of the event, but keeping with the same core, what kind of a deck could we make for the next Color Clash tournament? Leave a comment down below and let me know what you would change. But that's it for the moment. It's time to shut the lights and head on out. Thank you for visiting the Shiman Library, and I hope to see you here again.